I'll let you go ahead and just, you know, we know what we're working on here with the Expo Idaho property. And, you know, most of our questions, I think, stem around what you envision, you know, what you see could go on along the river there, what kind of a park it might be, what, what are your ideas is what we're looking for. Sure, so I, I'll just jump and, and I'm happy at any time if you'd like to interrupt for questions, that's really how I see this going um, personally, because when, when Kelly and I were exchanging some emails, I was trying to figure out exactly what it was uh, you wanted to learn about. And there were two items that came up and, and those two I'll, I will attempt to touch on. Uh, those items were, what do I know about the FACTS group, the Foundation for Ada Canyon Trail System, and those that are trying to create a valley-wide uh, bike pedestrian network and how this fits in to kind of the picture and maybe how that fits in. And then the other item that, that Kelly had suggested I hit on was, uh, you know, what, what do I think about the enhancement of that riparian area along the Boise River, the potential for Boise River recreation uh, from both the land and the, the river itself. So I'll kind of hit on those things. I'm going to Good. maybe just share my desktop if I can do that properly here. Uh, because I, it's easy to talk over like a, a Google Earth image, if that works for everybody. Sure. So it's real simple, I think, as long as I can share content. Um, so let's try this. I made you a presenter, so it should work. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, so so there's there's no surprises here. This is the... Expo Idaho uh, that is owned by Ada County, Expo Idaho property. And I'm going to toggle real quick to this if I can. Let's see if you see that. No, you don't see that. Or maybe it's pulling up right now. No, okay. Uh, but the bottom line here is that there's a couple of things. And in, in my influence as the director of Parks and Waterways and in, in my interaction with Expo Idaho property is really as it currently as it relates to that green line that you see here that represents the Boise River Greenbelt pathway. Yes. And, yep. And so so this is a, a portion of the Expo Idaho property that uh, in, in the past couple of years really, you know, Bob Batista as director of Expo Idaho, it's not really his arena necessarily to manage the the pathway system. It more falls under my umbrella uh, with parks and waterways and and we keep up to speed on the standards and, and levels of expectations and signage requirements and community interaction, those kinds of things from Greenbelt users. And so, so that's really where I, I'm sort of limited in, in my knowledge to the Expo property. I did serve as, as interim director for a short period of time and learned quite a bit uh, about Expo, but you know, in my role now, what I focus on is that Greenbelt pathway and that's really the, the main point of interaction between the Expo property and the river. And right now, for those that don't attend events at Expo, it's the main interaction that, that the local public uh, and visitors to the area have with the Expo property is through the Greenbelt. Mm -hmm. So over the past, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, you know, for, for uh, you know, a couple of decades, the Greenbelt was in pretty um, deplorable condition along this alignment. And we recently completed, let's see if I can share another screen here. I'll see if I can do that. Ooh, this is interesting. Okay. I'm trying to share another screen. I'll see if I can do it. Sure. Okay, so, so starting back at the end, this is the uh, Ada County Parks and Waterways Facebook page that we manage. So just uh, at the end of last calendar year, this is how we interact a lot with the public. We posted an update here regarding the Expo Idaho Citizens Advisory Committee and how it was beginning to take, sh take shape, but then how we also already had received approval from the Board of County Commissioners to improve this, this deplorable kind of greenbelt pathway connection. And 
we initiated that project as I scroll up here to some posts related to that. Bear with me. So we started this project really in earnest, kind of late February and early March. And these were the posts that we continued to engage the public uh, at that time. What the project did was it widened that connection, completely replacing that asphalt pathway, which was at best about nine feet wide of usable width. Uh, and it was encroached upon by the old fence with the overhanging barbed wire from the horse style stalls that were a part of the uh, racing component of Lavoie Racing there on Expo property. And we did several items there as part of this project with the Board of Commissioners support. We, we had to relocate a uh, fire hydrant. We removed several power poles and overhanging uh, overhead lines with Idaho Power. Uh, we, we did move the fence over about 10, 8 to 10 feet, depending on the location, to reduce that claustrophobic effect and to reduce the amount of shading on that pathway, uh, which is difficult for winter maintenance when you have so much shade and ice. And we had to we had to limb and trim and then cut down several trees that were encroaching encroaching on the pathway, uh, eight total trees in that location. So the project wasn't just you know replacing the asphalt and widening it. We had to do quite a bit of um, other uh, sort of peripheral projects in order for it to be uh, a great improvement to the pathway. And we began all this. It right at about the beginning of the pandemic. So it's it's really it was really a testament to our partnership with the all these folks we had to work with in the community and our operations department with Ada County uh, to get this thing done uh, and reopened. I'm just kind of scrolling through. We had several posts on this particular particular project, um, and it was ultimately uh, closed for some. Uh, the last stage was was closing it for the um, for the asphalt surface, which is what you see now on your screen here, the beginning of the asphalt overlay. And we've received a ton of positive feedback on this project since it was completed. And what we learned really through this project was there are a lot more users, not only that we didn't know would be using this this pathway now that we've improved it, but during the pandemic, we've seen about a 40% increase in Greenbelt usage throughout the entire system of the Boise River Greenbelt pathway. This project and the expo part of the pathway represents only about three quarters of a mile of the Boise River Greenbelt system, which is about 42 total miles between Boise City jurisdiction, Ada County jurisdiction, Garden City and City of Eagle jurisdiction. And then that small portion of the pathway just off of Expo Idaho property, that's the uh, foundation for parks and lands, which owns Plantation Island. So we feel really good about this project. I'm just kind of providing that overview so you realize the investment that was already made here for the Greenbelt. With the Board of Commissioners, it was a, we were very mindful of budget to get this project completed without breaking the bank because of this citizens advisory committee process we're not really sure you know what this particular location may look like in you know five six seven ten years down the road and so you know it's not a permanent alignment is i guess the best way to put it it's not right directly adjacent to the river that is subject to potential flooding and damage so on one hand yes it's easier for maintenance on the other hand that's kind of the appeal of the green belt anyway, so it's hard to hard to say that you know we should um, you know move it away. Now, yeah, I think I was thinking more in terms of protecting the river and protecting that river bank. If that was a necessity, that it it should or needs to be moved over. I I don't mean away from the river, but just in order to to protect the river. Yeah, it in terms of protecting the river in this in this particular location um you know i it's hard for me to say i what i'll do if i can get back to my google earth i'm going to see if i can jump to share that again so i'll try to show you by example how this area is a little bit better off than some areas oops let me try that again This 
So on this Google Earth image, you can actually see the, the river as a whole. You, you want to look kind of from the south bank where the Greenbelt is located here to the north. Mm -hmm. And in this particular location along the Expo Idaho's property, you know, what you want to see for healthy, healthy habitat and a and healthy river ecosystem really is sinuosity of the river itself. So does it have access to kind of move about the floodplain and floodway? And it is sort of restricted in certain areas, but as a whole, you've got this, you've got a side channel in some islands, even upstream, you've got plantation islands where you've got this wide river channel in two different um, corridors, which is great for uh, fish spawning habitat and side channels for rearing, um, for rearing specific trout specifically. And the same applies as you work your way downstream along the Expoido property. It's, it's one of the wider uh, riparian corridors of the river where you actually have these island features and you have um, side access channels of the river to mm -hmm. explore the floodplain. Now, just to, to kind of show you an example, as you move downstream from Glenwood, you'll notice there's quite a bit of difference just in the immediate vicinity here as you enter Garden City. So before you get to the head of Eagle Island, you know, it's a fairly narrow and channelized portion of the river. Um, yes. You know, you do have some features adjacent to the river where you have groundwater that occupies these sort of, you know, lakes that are that are great for these residents. but it, it does get more more channelized because of development encroaching along the river further downstream, and I think that's part of if I if I you know understand what the Army Corps and, and Garden City are interested in. That's part of the reason why you know perhaps there's a need to protect some of these these homes that are closer to the to the river itself downstream. So the green belt. What I'll the way to answer your question, I guess, is to say the green belt itself is not necessarily impacting river health here, but it is. It is a portion. This property, as we kind of now know, is a, is an area that could, help protect downstream users from potential, flood impacts in the future. I think everybody could probably agree on that. Yes. Good. Thank you. Sure. Now. To kind of hit on that as one last item on this piece of property, you know, integrating what I think is referred to in this process as, let's see if I can get back to this. It's this flood consideration zone, I think has been identified. So this zone three as part yeah. of the citizens advisory committee process in kind of a perfect world from a, maybe a parks director standpoint, you know, right where that number three is, or maybe even further downstream, if, if, these, if these structures weren't, weren't located there in that flood zone, I, I think it'd be really kind of neat and interesting to see what could be done to maybe have, you know, kind of a, as you approach where the old track is, you know, kind of have maybe a clover leaf into a park area where, you know, you may still have this same or similar alignment of the green belt. Um, if needed, you could possibly move it further into the expo property if that was something that the advisory committee and the board and, and expo would like to see happen. Uh, but it, it'd be, I think it'd be pretty neat you know, again, in a perfect world where there aren't all these restrictions and things um, to maybe integrate a park uh, in that area where kind of you see the, the the text that says flood consideration zone. I think I think it's it's a unique opportunity to tie in the green belt and this this property to that. Um, yes, to, to make it more appealing for park visitors. Now, one last item on the green belt and sort of why this expo property is a unique portion of the of the green belt and it has to do with the marigold parking lot yes so i mentioned those 42 miles of total green belt property and the marigold lot is truly the only sort of designated 
park and walk, park and ride connection to the green belt that's just for the green belt. What I mean by that is it's it's a pretty robust parking lot for that area. And if you look around mm -hmm. along the entire green belt system, what you typically have, you may have a lot of parking, like Willow Lane is a Boise City Park that has a lot of parking. Barber Park is one of our parks that has a lot of parking. Um, others like Julia Davis and um, you know uh, the, the Esther Simplot, they all have a lot of parking, but they're integrated in a park. And they're not just the designated kind of get on the green belt parking lot. Whereas this Marigold lot is truly sort of the one unique lot like that on the system. And it, it serves now more folks that wish to maybe park and ride their bikes to work, you know, coming from the western part of the valley west of Glenwood, you know, they can actually park here and as a designated parking facility and and use this connection to ride all the way into work or to BSU for school or, you know, and, and utilize it um, much like you would use a commuter van ride park and ride within a van situation. So that's what's sure. really kind of key. It's it's a this is a very critical connection to the pathway system to have this parking lot. And then the other component is this is one of those locations on the system that does not have a safe designated greenbelt connection on the opposite side of the river. So immediately downstream, you have that you have a pedestrian connection through Garden City on the north side of the river, and you have a multi-use connection on the south side of the river. And those carry forward quite a ways down river. Um, all the way to Eagle Road, really, uh, mm -hmm. on, as you get to the island. And as you proceed upriver, once you get past this location at East 52nd, the Greenbelt picks up again on this south side of the river and continues on the north side of the river. And you really have both sides of the river connected in an upstream, downstream um, way with Greenbelt. This, this property represents sort of the only connection. And that's sort of where I'll jump into where the facts group kind of comes into this, the foundation for the Ada Canyon trail systems. And what they are is it's a group that sort of picked up where the what was called the Boise River Trails Coalition left off. That was a coalition of all kinds of uh, agencies and local government representatives from Ada and Canyon counties whose primary goal was to connect the the green belt from the uh, Lucky Peak State Park immediately downstream from Sandy Sandy Beach area and what's called Discovery Park all the way to the Snake River. So that's a 64 mile stretch of river. And the objective of that group was to try to connect to the green belt from top to bottom throughout the community for recreation and alternative transportation. And FACTS at, at one point was, was chaired by former commissioner, uh, Judy PV Durr. And mm -hmm. Judy still is affiliated with FACTS as is Sharon Hubbler, who's been very involved for years with that committee. And it's now chaired by Bill Gigray, who's an attorney out in Caldwell and you know very engaged in the, in the commuter issue and, and in alternative transportation. It's a group that doesn't have any true you know, there's there's they're a 501c3 not registered nonprofit. I do participate and represent Ada County as a kind of a, a um, an ex officio member of that committee, and they what they're what they're trying to do now is is really encourage all local governments to invest in maintenance and repair of existing greenbelt, and then help to make connections where there's missing links in the green belt. And so what they're working on right now with the city of Eagle, and I'm just gonna zoom down here on Google, is they're trying to make this one key connection that's currently the missing link between Eagle Island State Park and the rest of the green belt. So they're working on this connection where I'm hovering is where you have kind of Bar Denae and the Riverside Hotel, that's where my right. cursor and this pathway called the Mace River Trail kind of is on the opposite side of the river. Um, the 
This is the north channel of the Boise River. And the Mace Trail currently ends kind of in the vicinity of this small lake. Um, and the, what they're working on now is to connect this last piece to Eagle Island State Park. Um, Fax, I said, like I mentioned, is working with the city of Eagle and others to try to make this the, the State Department of Lands as jurisdiction in the in the river to make this connection happen, along with the private property owners, of course, that would need to grant an easement. So it's all kind of above board on the record that this is being worked on. But that's sort of what Fax is doing. They're trying to fill in pieces of the puzzle. They work a lot with the Community Planning Association of Southwest Idaho, Compass, for um, you know studies and commuter connections and things of that nature. And they're trying to be more vocal with how pieces like Expo tie into the big picture. The, the one other interest that they have that I think others share is there's also a connection from this Highway 44 Glenwood and Highway 26 Chinden corner. There's mm -hmm. kind of a beat up asphalt pathway that runs parallel to Glenwood on Expo property and it kind of goes in a really badly root intruded area here by Hawk Stadium. <laughs> Continues on to connect down to the to the Marigold lot and the Greenbelt. I think Fax is really interested in, you know, this committee's ability to maybe encourage an enhancement of that connection since this is such a key intersection here. Are there any questions on the fact side of things or anything I covered? I know I'm kind of going over a lot right now. I'll pause for anything. No, I think that was that was very clear. Brianna or Kelly, do you have any questions? No. Um it, it was it was a very good presentation, Scott. I appreciate that. that you've done upstream and one of the one of the questions that um, we did have was: Is there anything we should be thinking about that might complicate, excuse me, the surf park upriver from us? Thank you, Andrea. Your your microphone breaks. I'm I'm not breaking up. Also, that that's a great question. That's a good segue into this second um, prompt that Kelly gave me, which is Boise River for recreation. You know, it, I don't I don't. So we don't manage the water. Can you hear me okay? You're kind of breaking up a little bit. Let's see if Kelly can. Is it okay, can, Kelly? Can you hear me okay now? I think I'm okay. Yes. So just to just to point out that the Whitewater Park, both phases, that's managed by Boise Parks and Recreation, not mm -hmm. Ada County Parks and Waterways. And I'll tell you what the in terms of connectivity to that, I can't really speak to it. Um, you know, because you're quite a ways downstream from that. But what I will say is one of the concerns that pops up quite a lot is so the, the Boise River I mentioned is 64 miles. There's a six mile stretch of that from Barber Park to Ann Morrison Park that is registered, I mean, I'm sorry, managed and, and, uh, and, and designated as what we call for non uh, or novice floater recreation, I should say. Yeah. We have a management plan for that. It's kind of the designated float stretch for tubers and everything like that. And we manage that, that portion of river in collaboration with Boise Fire, with Boise Forestry, with Ada County Sheriff Marine Patrol, Boise Parks, and then like I mentioned, Ada County uh, Parks and Waterways. So we do quite a bit in that six mile stretch. What often happens is in this area, kind of in and around Glenwood and, and in that Whitewater Park kind of area, as you, re, you kind of continue downstream, that area is not managed for hazards or mitigated in any way for like novice recreation. So what happens sort of annually and more frequently depending on the year is we get recreational tubers and floaters in this portion of the river and there are down trees and snags and obstacles and really 
sort of dangerous conditions, what we call strainers or sweepers on the river created by overhanging trees or submerged trees and obstacles. And, you know, to enhance this area, there probably is potential, but it's kind of a bigger picture than just creating uh, access or kind of, you know, launch areas for that kind of recreation, what we would call primary contact recreation, where people are really interacting with the water. Uh, so, so you'd have to have kind of just not just invest in portions of the property, but there's kind of a management strategy and approach to make sure you're not encouraging people to do things that are really going to get them in trouble. Now, having said that, what I know about this stretch of river is that it's, it's a pretty popular angler access. A lot of fishermen try to use this portion of the river, whether that's at the, the Marigold uh, lot area or even further up river. There's a lot of fishermen that, that do kind of um, enter this area. And I, I think of the one consideration that I just look at off the top, you know, and I'm going to zoom in on it, is if that, if the RV park stays where the RV park is, due to its proximity to the river where you do have kind of a, a trail that is formed um, and a kind of a narrow riparian area here, and you do have the parking and people do fish kind of in this area, you know, I just kind of wonder if creating a designated access point somewhere in this vicinity um, for, you know, and what I mean is maybe a fishing pier that is extended into the river or maybe an access point if if there was an effort to kind of encourage drift boating. There's a, there's a diversion not too far downstream from here called the New Dry Creek Diversion. So I don't know that you want to necessarily encourage drift boating, although boaters do it. Um, but but that's the one thing I would say. One consideration is, you know, maybe see how this portion of the property could be utilized differently to, you know, create a designated access point, um, not necessarily tied to the Whitewater Park upstream, but maybe its own thing to give folks that currently use that area maybe a better way to utilize that area, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense completely. And if we can incorporate some kind of an educational uh, information. I don't know if it's a, you know, if it's a sign or if it's a board or if it's a little um, kiosk, if you will. Um, I, I think that's, that's something, it's another opportunity that, that we should consider. Yeah. And I, and I would agree, even as you mentioned kind of kiosks and things like that, I, I'm a big fan of, of any enhancements to education and outreach for youth on these kinds of areas. So, you know, there are those opportunities. There would need to be some work put into that as well, where, you know, you, you potentially could have, because again, the parking area really facilitates that. You could have groups of school buses come in and potentially learn about aspects of, uh, of the riparian habitat recreation and those kinds of things. So I don't know if that's what you were necessarily referring to in designating access and having signage related to that, but you could also hypothetically in conjunction with 4-H and Allen's efforts out there with uh, the extension office, you know, there's, there's some pretty cool opportunities to do hands-on mm -hmm. learning on the expo property related to the river as well. So those are just right. a few there. Great. I don't, Kelly or Brianna, any any other questions? Oh, hearing oh. none. I think I, I think you've answered all my questions. It was, a, it was a great presentation, Scott. We really appreciate your time and all the information. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you was we have an upcoming meeting in August. Um, are you available? for any follow-up questions for maybe 30 minute time period between, oh, I don't know, 5.45 and 6.15 or so? Yeah. Right. Kelly? I can't seem to recall that date. I think Brianna had mentioned in an email that we would be getting a, a calendar invite. And right. yeah, I would be happy to answer any follow-up questions. I, I, I hope I didn't ramble too much on this and I apologize <laughs> for not PowerPoint presentation, but if, yeah, specific oh, questions. Typed or you know sent. I'm happy to answer anything I can. 
That'd be great. And I appreciate you getting the Google Earth map up there because I think that really that really shows exactly what you were talking about. And um, to see it overhead like that, have the like the width of the river. Um, no, it was very informative. So appreciate that very much. Great. I'm glad to be of some help. And like I say, just feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or anything. We'll do it. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Bye-bye.